Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here and joining us on this installment of Smith Film Talk. We know you have plenty of alternative viewing options right now, um, and we appreciate you for being here live with us. Um, we're about to discuss the film Hidden Blueprints, the story of Mikey. Um, and so before we get started with that, we're going to uh, watch a quick clip from the film and then we'll be right back with you guys. Welcome. We are joined by um, director Jeremy Lee McKenzie and producer Aaron Reinhardt. Meinhardt? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for being here and joining us. Um, how are you both doing today? <laughs> uh, do, doing okay. D determined to try to have a good day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, I think that's, yeah. That's a lot of us these days, but um, I'm very excited to talk about this film again with you guys, though, because um, this is, you know, one just a very memorable one for me. Um, it was in the film festival two years ago, I think, 2018. Uh, if that sounds right. Yeah, tw 2019. I think it might have been 2019. Oh, 2019, right? Oh, oh. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Maybe I think it was wrong. 2019. It's just what, what is, is time? time? What is time? Where did it go? <laughs> <laughs> five Same. years ago. Uh, I think we five can all agree ago. it was at least five years ago. <laughs> Some number of years. So take us back then, please, to the five or however many years ago it was that um, this film actually got started. What was kind of the beginning of, um, I mean, clearly, Jeremy, for, for you, you had been thinking about this for a long time. Um, but what was kind of the beginning process of actually making this particular short film? Um, the beginning process of this particular short film uh, was probably Aaron and I sitting in my living room in Burlington, Vermont, uh, editing together uh, an early iteration of the story that uh, was trying to tell. Um, it had taken a quite a while I think because it's a personal story because it's a story that's close to me and close to people who are involved with it um it had taken a while to find the path into telling it um and uh I have a memory of at one point editing together a little video with Aaron where I'd recorded some narration that was just focused on telling a piece of the story and then uh Aaron and I were just trying to flesh it out into a um a little video that we could use for pitching to start getting some support for making the actual film. And uh, uh, somehow that little video that we made sent us on a very long and strange <laughs> journey. <laughs> uh, I, I'll let Aaron speak to that a little bit too. I, I'm sure he has some thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, in a lot of ways, it started when I first met you and you told me your story. And that was such a big, <laughs> big story um, that you had to tell. And you met, it. sorry, you both met, you met in in college, right? It was where uh, you met or? Sort of, sort of. Oh. Uh, yeah. Um, I, uh, yeah, we attended the same college, but I don't think we overlapped or maybe for a semester. But um, I had graduated by that point. And um, yeah, I saw a bunch of uh, like the like friends and collaborators and stuff I saw were meeting with um, Jay Lee um, 
and yeah, Burlington is a small town and it's like any, but any group of that many talented people together, you want to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And um, so I reached out to Jay Lee and he told me like, like he, he was prepping um, a different film at that point and it was probably a couple films um until uh we got to hidden blueprints but from very early on that was, seemed like a story that you know needed to be told and uh he was interested in telling and i was interested in helping him tell and um, yeah, I mean, that's that's film, you know, it's like you got to do this one to get to this one to get to this one. And uh, yeah, and uh, here we are. Right. So, yeah, I mean, um, because this is such a personal story and the fact that there there seems to be there's so much there. There is a lot of story kind of packed into this short film um, and of and you know, all those personal elements, what was that kind of process like of um, constructing a cohesive narrative of these? Because I would imagine there's probably a lot that you um, left out or simplified, um, but you sure. you managed to get a lot in. There's the story passing, there's kind of the parallel of the story itself, and then um, your story, the story of the prison riot, um, all of that. <laughs> How did you kind of meld that? Yeah, um, I think it, you know, it, uh, I guess part of the early journey of coming to tell the story was uh, through the art show itself, because mm -hmm. there's the artwork that the story, the, there's the artwork that was designed in prison after the riot um, that uh, there's all the wood scroll work that, um, is used as a storytelling device in the film. While I was in college, I had cut my way through a certain amount of the scroll work and suddenly started getting art shows. And then at the art shows, I was thrust into a position where I had to be telling stories that were specific to the pieces of artwork mm. to audiences. And I had to be telling them over and over and over again. And um, through that process, I was able to start refining the way that I was speaking, refining the way that I was telling a story and realizing what parts were important or less important mm. to tell and how to condense things. And um, people like Aaron were there for different parts of that and were, uh, you know, involved with different parts of that. Um, and uh, it was through uh, working with Aaron and um, a small handful of others. Uh, Aaron was really one of the core people that I spent a lot of time with this film on. Um, we, we were in the trenches quite a bit, uh, but it was really through that process that um, I was able to get there. There's been um, a number of times where people have commented on uh, Hidden Blueprints is a, uh, it's a different kind of film. It's a lot of things at the same time. Yeah, it's something that uh, I'm very aware of that and that in some ways you could point to that as its weakness, but it also has been pointed to as uh, a strength in that it is all these different things at the same time, but somehow manages to keep a narrative that weaves through them all. Um, and that was one of our primary goals yeah. was to tell yeah. the story how it needs to be told and as much of its complexity as it can maintain while keeping its thread that goes through. Yeah, I teased Jay Leah. I'm like, I don't think it's a good short film. <laughs> like, 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 I mean, I think it's a successful film, but like, like a short is kind of its own genre and it's so boiled down and specific. And I'm really happy that, you know, that we got away with it. <laughs> um, uh, but but it, yeah, in a lot of ways, it's not a successful short. It's successful, it is a short film that is successful in spite of sort of its ambition and storytelling. Yeah, it's almost like a feature short film. <laughs> like it, like it, it, in terms of the amount of content in it and things yeah. it and does and <laughs> places it goes and span of time that it crosses. Most short films don't weave a narrative that goes that many years. Right. We had a great experience, uh, just, just real quickly, e editing another short of uh, Jay Lee's before that. And I do think that that process really sort of helped. We, we took 
that like sort of tightly controlled editing, boiling things down and controlling the narrative into the pre-production of Hidden Blueprints, which really sort of allowed us mm. to sort of get away with um, the structure. Yeah, well, you know, I would, I would say that, um, ooh, there goes my earpiece. Um, <laughs> I would say that I, I think it is actually a successful short film. Um, it feels like it shouldn't be because of, you know, what you just said, where there's so much to it. And I was really aware of that the second time, but I think why it does feel pretty succinct and, and like it, it does work as a short film is, is kind of what you touched on a bit where I think it's because you let the art kind of dictate the narrative and the story is, um, while there is a lot of information in the narrative, the, the visual story works really well as a, in that short format. I think that's kind of what, that's my theory of, I think what ties it together. And um, maybe you could speak to that, you know, as, as an artist of multiple mediums that you incorporated into this. Did you have any thoughts on that? Uh, we, I think we did all of the things we wanted to do on Hidden Blueprints. <laughs> 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 I know they, they say, you know, uh, it's such a strange term, kill your, I was going to say kill your babies, kill your darlings. Um, and I think we did kill some darlings in that, yet still did all of the things that we wanted to do, use all of the tools we could to tell the story, keep as much of its um essence <laughs> essence as possible actually from um from the uh you know we got some feedback at different times that um that uh people were interested in seeing uh, um uh what if this film just focused on the story of mikey what if it was just this smaller uh mm. piece that focused just on that and um i so later on i actually did go back and uh, cut a film that was just that and it still worked. Mm -hmm. Maybe Aaron said mm -hmm. maybe better as a short film, <laughs> but, it was, but it was a different film. Yeah. You know, like it was different. It, yeah. it wasn't the same as uh, Hidden Blueprints and it has it had its own kind of strengths in terms of its um, isolation, uh, in terms of its focus, but um, I'm very proud that with Hidden Blueprints, uh, we did everything we intended to do and, and were able to accomplish it. Uh, it. It made me, for one, feel more prepared to tackle larger projects and to move on to more ambitious projects. <laughs> That's funny because I kind of think, what is more ambitious than training a praying mantis, several praying manti, um, reenactment, working with children, Going, did you, you, was there, if I remember correctly, you actually had a prison location. To yes. Film. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> we could create a riot in a prison. <laughs> well, and you had, you had, um, you had some um, former inmates actually reenacting yeah. in that as well. So can you tell us about kind of how you infused, um, well, let's see, what, where do we start? Let's talk about them. Let's talk about, um, bringing those folks in to um, play these roles? Um, yeah, that was something that was um, important to me. You know, there was, uh, if I flash back to, <laughs> to the riot in um, the Lee Adjustment Center in the prison in Kentucky, I remember a moment uh, when the riot was like, finally the facility was being retaken and there was a whole bunch of us on a hillside with our hands zip tied behind our backs. We had just gotten like hosed down with mace fog canisters and were somehow laughing because it was pretty, it's just like- What else are you gonna do? It, like, yeah, what, this is, <laughs> yeah, we're crying and laughing at the same time and our face burns. Um, but uh, I remember looking around at some of the guys and some of the guys who were particularly involved with what had happened and sang like, uh, I, I will, this is going to come back around one day. Like I, I will d do something in regard to this and we'll try and do something for you guys also. And, um, 
that. So I guess for me, when I when we started making uh, when we said when it became clear that we were going to make this film, um, it became important to me to reach back out to some of those people, the ones who were still around, the ones who were available, and to um, ask them if they wanted to be involved with making the film. So I got to, we got to, you know, get a group of them and bring them back into, a, bring them into a prison to tell a piece of that story to tell the story of Mikey and yeah. to tell the story of what um, led up to uh, the riot and you know the, in, in those moments so and being with them in a prison that we had control over was a, a very different yeah uh, yeah what was that like was there any sort of catharsis or I don't know any or was it I mean what was that like for them did they share any thoughts about that kind of bizarre meta experience of reenacting an experience that they had been through uh at the at the time it seemed very cathartic for everybody who was involved mm -hmm. uh at the time it seemed like it was a i know for some of them it was a really meaningful experience i, I think how those feelings translate over time only time can tell mm -hmm. <laughs> I know my feelings about things are constantly evolving um i know that um I know there was a particular moment that I'm sure Aaron remembers uh, when we were in a um, we were in a cell, and I was in a cell with some of the guys, and um, I, I think our AD came to the yeah, cell. Cal. Yeah, Cal, Cal Hopwood, and uh, he had um, a, a radio with him, and he comes up and he's like. You know, and this is very typical of, you know, you're in a cell and somebody comes to the door and they have a radio, it's a guard. <laughs> and only now Cal comes and he's got a radio and he's like, hey guys, <laughs> there's ice cream sandwiches here. <laughs> we looked at him and we're like, yeah, we want some ice cream sandwiches. And he's like, pulls his radio and he's like, can we get some ice cream sandwiches to sell too? <laughs> <laughs> and it was just it was hilarious yeah. <laughs> it was, like it was a real twist on previous experience yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah i'll never forget you y'all looking at each other um when uh we were shooting the exteriors the um the uh, big group scene in the prison yard which was a tennis court that we made out to look like a prison yard <laughs> and you all just like looking across the yard and you're just you know you're you're in your outfits and everything and it's just like the number of times you have seen each other in that situation but now <laughs> yeah. you know you're playing there's you're a camera pretending, and there's yeah. a tent and her makeup is over there and <laughs> you just couldn't look at each other without laughing <laughs> yeah it was different <laughs> Uh, well, that's incredible. I kind of love that as like, you know, part of the documentary experience um, that, you know, that's I remember uh, before we, um, you know, during the festival, I brought this up where, where one of the things I really loved about it is it bends the idea of documentary so much. And it kind of feels like, you know, the authenticity of having these. What am I trying to say? Like these experiences are kind of part of what the film became in a, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah, our, um, that was one of our intentions. I mean, it is, we called, you know, we called the film a doc in the sense that it is narrative nonfiction. Um, and it has doc elements, um, but it's definitely not a traditional doc and it doesn't really live by doc rules. It lives more by, uh, it lives more by like uh, the rules of narrative fiction. It's like using the rules of one story to tell a different story, you know, or one filmmaking style. In fact, it kind of lives by the rules of multiple filmmaking styles. Mm. Um, but, you know, that was, that was an important thing for us was, um, I think the experiences in between like that were an important part of that process. Yeah. yeah, I think that circle is so interesting, too, because a documentary is, you know, you're taking real lived experiences and putting it to film. But here we're taking like real people with lived experiences 
on film to relive these moments that weren't captured and like yeah it, it's it's really interesting and i do think that there was a a catharsis or control of you know of people who didn't have control over their experiences coming back in a way you know narrative filmmaking is one of complete control like down to the detail um and yeah yeah it's really sort of beautiful to see that come all the way back around mm. yeah yeah. It was it was wonderful working with Mikey too. <laughs> yes, yes. Tell us about the because there were multiple, or was yeah, there, yeah. So tell us about how one goes about training a praying mantis. <laughs> well, they, if you're kind to them and you feed them and you take care of them, they kind of train themselves. Um, they uh, they just uh, they're very friendly creatures that uh you can that have they're one of the few insects maybe the only insect uh that has the ability to like make direct eye contact with you to like turn its head and look into your eyes um and that's a really unique thing like that it just is a different kind of connection you know when you look at an ant it doesn't typically look up at you and make eye contact uh, nothing against ants. I like them quite a bit, but, um, the, uh, you know, same with a spider, but a praying mantis, you know, like if you walk into a room, it'll turn and look at you. Um, you know, and if, uh, you get to a point where it knows its own name, um, which some people wouldn't believe, yeah. uh, but they can, um, then, or at least damn well seem to, um, then, they'll be responsive to that too. Um, you know, I remember the first time that, uh, I, I, there was some skepticism among a number of people in the production sure. uh, as to how <laughs> the praying mantis situation was going to play out. Yeah. And I was like, no, no, trust me. It's going to be just fine. It's going to be okay. And I remember the moment of realization for Aaron. I'll let him tell you about yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we were spending some time with a few different mantises. One didn't work out. It just wasn't right for the part. <laughs> um, he was afraid of crickets. It's like, like you can't play. You're not Mikey. You can't play Mikey you're if you're afraid of cr crickets. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I was just, yeah, and like I noticed the eye contact, you know, it's just like there, there's this mantis looking right at me as I'm talking to it. And I'm talking, <laughs> like, you know, there's this, this lineage and this history. And, you know, I'm just, I'm just like, just I explaining that, you know, Mikey was a real man mantis and did these things and they're explaining like, this to the mantis yeah really? yeah 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 and i'm just <laughs> talking to him i think he was on jay lee's hand or something and just right in the middle of my sentence i'm just like there's a legacy to uphold and it just flies and like just like lands right on my third eye and starts crawling around on my head and <laughs> And I'm oh, like, this is the one. Like, <laughs> he gets it. <laughs> like, he's, he's, he's telling, yeah. Now, now he's telling me something. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, if there's one takeaway, we hope that audiences are endeared to praying mantis uh, bugs now. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. What happened to them? Did you just let them go afterwards, or how did you come about them? Actually, is that something you order? That's just my random curiosity that popped into my head now. Like, how did you come by the mantis? Yeah, you can order mantises or you can order um, like eggs for mantises and they'll like hatch. Um, the, uh, um, we, yeah, and then you just, you feed them and raise them. Do you still, I'm curious, do you keep them or have a relationship with them now? Um, well, uh, well or... I'm in, uh, I, my life has been very busy in grad school, so uh, I haven't yeah. been in a position to have um, uh, <laughs> been focused on trying to take care of myself and take care of uh, the world that's in front of me, uh, right. which has its own poses enough of its own challenges. So I, uh, not at the moment, but uh, we just uh, we <laughs> recently finished 
uh, just before the pandemic hit, we finished another film and the actress on that, who was also a child, uh, Lily Oliver, um, she saw Hidden Blueprints. Oh. And then her and her sister went and got, um, uh, Capri <laughs> Oliver went and got uh, praying mantis eggs and are now raising a Mikey, raising oh. a praying mantis named Mikey. <laughs> so I get little videos of the <laughs> Mikey all the time. <laughs> That's adorable. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> the legacy of Mikey, man, like legend. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, let's see. The mantis, the praying mantis is a big discussion topic that I, I wanted to hit. And now that I've got that satisfied, <laughs> um, can you tell us uh, just about um, kind of what happened with the film after and sort of what you've gone on to do and are working on now, um, both of you? Sure. Um, the, uh, so after we finished the film, we submitted to festivals. We uh, had a, a pretty good festival run. We're really honored to play at Santa Barbara. Um, it was an excellent experience um, and was, uh, and are really honored to have it featured again in this film talk series. Um, the uh, ended up using the film for grad school submissions. Um, I got into USC, um, was admitted with a George Lucas scholarship and am now finishing my, my MFA here um, in LA. So uh, that, was, uh, that was a really unexpected uh, journey that the film took me on and took us on. Jilly, um, because Aaron ended up coming to LA as well and is uh, making films out here. Uh, in terms of uh, stuff that working on now, um, we made another, we both made a number of other films since then, but um, we made another film together uh, where he was actually the DP on it um, this spring. Uh, we got a grant from the Peter Stark producing program at USC and uh, directed a film called Hurricane um, with uh, two produ producers from Stark, uh, Mitchell Coley and Sade Sargent. And um, uh, it was also a children's story, uh, a film about a young girl um, overcoming some, uh, a really challenging uh, childhood living situation. Um, and uh, yeah, got to work with Aaron on this, with him as a DP this time, which was awesome. <laughs> Uh, and some and, uh, other people as with Mitchell and Chardet as producers, which was yeah, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we we felt really we got re we're so grateful and felt so lucky we got to finish production directly before the pandemic hit. Like we spent a year in pre production, and then our last day of production was at Marchfield Air Force Base, the day that they were flying in coronavirus evacuees from Wuhan. So like we, we wrapped production on the film and then directly after that, um, all the lockdown, the film production got shut down. So we ended up pivoting. And yeah, you did post in quarantine. Yeah, right? we did post in quarantine. We yeah, did post, post, post that close. Uh, but if it wasn't for when we finished, we wouldn't have had it. So wow. that was, that's, yeah. I guess I'll pass that right. off to Aaron now. He's, he's got some other stuff he's been doing too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, uh, moved to LA, uh, in no small part because of this guy. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a partner in Julie Pacino's uh, production company, Tiny Apples. Uh, Julie was our executive producer on Hidden Blueprints. And uh, uh, that was a big way of uh, how we got to know her. Um, I shot um, shot two shorts, uh, Nowhere to Go, which is making a uh, festival rounds and uh, it's been getting a lot of uh, success in festivals and uh, Harmony and Gold and uh, is in post and uh, should be uh, should be on the same path soon. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, we have a few um, other things, uh, a doc, um, tentatively called uh, brainstorms that uh, we're working on with um, about uh, uh, veterans and other people who have su sustained traumatic brain injury 
and um, trying to take a lot of the same approach from the hidden blueprints and sort of stuff mm -hmm. making really sensory doc, something that describes an experience. Um, and um, yeah, yeah, so, um, so Tiny Apples, um, lots of exciting projects there. And uh, yeah, really happy to um, be in LA and feel like we're just, bring more and more people <laughs> over from the east coast <laughs> julie's moved to la um yeah i think uh we're sort of the tip of the spear bringing a lot of uh friends back from new york and vermont and uh it just it's a good place to be um good place to make movies and good place to show movies and, uh, yeah that's great um, so then I, I always like to ask um, this question at the end too, which is what is, uh, what would you say is kind of the most essential wisdom that you gained from working on Story of Mikey and, or Hidden Blueprints, you know, Hidden Blueprints, um, and what's kind of the wisdom you gained and what would you tell to other filmmakers wanting to um, do something maybe similar or take on something kind of daunting like you did what would what would your advice be or your advice to your former selves maybe even <laughs> before it started um uh hidden blueprints was a film that changed me as a filmmaker uh i think everything i had done before that felt like a warm-up um and hidden blueprints was uh you know i feel like there's a number of small like everything that you do is like working up to that next thing. And um, Hidden Blueprints was particularly ambitious for a short film. As you mentioned earlier, the scale and volume of things that had to be done in it. And um, that film made me uh, much more prepared for the time we were able to take on that film made me much more prepared to tackle a film like the next one we made, Hurricane, which has a similarly large scale of things that it does in one film. Like uh, we had to work with a, a marine coordinator had five boats on the water working with children, like working with a jet, working with all kinds of different, um, many locations in one film, many, lo many situations. And um, Hidden Blueprints made me prepared for things like that. Um, which that in turn made me feel like I'm ready for a feature. So it's like, uh, I, I don't know if that's speaking to the wisdom that you asked about, but yeah. it, it's the experience from it that came. Yeah. Jumping into something, being able to take the time to do something that's ambitious. And I mean that, like take the time to do something that's ambitious, um, prepares you to use your time more effectively mm. you know, when you're trying to do something more ambitious again. That's great, Aaron. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, to not be afraid of uh, doing something that's big or ambitious or, or be, be afraid, but do it anyway. Um, <laughs> and yeah, yeah, and just be, be conscious of who you're working with and, you know, just, uh, yeah, and working to support them always, um, you know, just you, you have, have this team, uh, like filmmaking is such a team sport. And the, uh, yeah, the, the more, yeah, yeah, so, so ta tackle that ambition, take the time, do the work, and also yeah, just just be be mindful that you're all working together, and how can I help them do their job? How can I help him do his job? Help? How can I help her do her job? Um, and as yeah, yeah, and I and I think it's just it it's really starts and ends there. Like every everything else, you know, can be luck and chance and just randomness but I think if um, as long as you're doing uh, doing work that you're passionate about and enabling others to do work that they're passionate about that's um, that's going to bring you somewhere important. 
Aaron is very good at what he just described. <laughs> we, we all are. <laughs> um, I love your guys' bromance. It just, it definitely comes through. <laughs> it's nice. Um, well, Aaron, uh, Jeremy, thank you guys again so much for being here. It was great to get to talk about this movie again and see you guys again. And um, really looking forward to what you guys bring us next. Um, so take care and uh, we'll be back next week with another installment of Smith Film Talk. So. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much, Audrey. Thanks, Audrey. It's so nice to see you. Yeah, you too. <laughs> Bye.